So a few quick reminders. The project, you should have had your first meeting by now or today or I guess tomorrow. You can still have it. Make sure you're filling out your team meeting form for your meeting this week. Me, um, this week, it's uh, it's probably just discussing what you want to build for your project. Looking at the requirements and coming up with an app idea that meets these requirements. Uh, if you're ready to start coding, that's all the better. Uh, but at this point, at least discussing what your project will end up being. What do you want to build? Do you want a social media site? Do you want a game? Uh, whatever you want to build where your group uh, agrees on. Something, ideally something you're excited about. Uh, you, you, I mean, these five features build you a pretty nice app that, that does things, you know, um, uh, a pretty legitimate app with these features. So try to make it something worth building, something that you want to see out there. It's something that you'd like to host after the class. I highly recommend it. Make Take this opportunity to build something really cool. Uh, or if not, if you just want to get your grade and get out of here, that's fine too. But make sure you and your teammates agree on what you want to build and where you are, you're at. If you're all on the same page, it's going to be a lot smoother semester. Uh, and a lot of that's uh, teaching 442 so many times with that ex experience. Uh, I've seen a lot of groups melt down because they form around an idea for a project that the entire team is not behind. And especially if you just have one person who pitches the idea and they're like, ah, I love this idea. I'm excited about it. I've seen this way too many times. I don't know what's up with this. One person pitches the idea. The rest of the team's like, yeah, whatever. We'll just go with this team. That that student seems really passionate. My teammate seems passionate. Halfway through this semester, that student who seemed really passionate about the idea just completely loses interest in it for whatever reason. And the rest of the team stuck with this idea that they never cared about to begin with. Uh, so I don't know what the best way to prevent that is just being aware of it can probably help uh, don't let one teammate take over the idea uh, and it's an idea that nobody else cares about try to come up with something that everybody's excited about it's going to make the semester go a lot smoother because you all be excited about the final product um, but anyway i didn't want to talk too much about that uh, another quick reminder homework two is out today's lecture is uh, i would say the most important lecture for homework two uh, and also next lecture on Monday when we're going over today's content, but just giving examples, I'll go into the code and uh, show how to apply today's uh, today's content in a couple of different languages. Uh, so uh, um, so heads up on that that today and Monday's lecture are the most important ones for homework two. Uh, it'll get you through objectives one, two, and three, and then objective four is going to be Wednesday's content. Uh, so with that, everybody's hyped for today's content. Let me, I gotta click one thing over here. There we go. Let's do this. Do we have to have project ideas approved? I mean, yes, yes and no. No, I'm not gonna pre-approve them. If you're, uh, if you're uh, worried about it, you can ask me and I'll give you an answer. But no, you don't have to get them pre-approved. Uh, I'll trust your judgment on. Uh, on whether it meets those five criteria or not. The reason it, it kind of is approved, why I say both there, is when I go to grade the projects or at your first checkpoint, if it doesn't meet those five criteria, you know, it's gonna affect your grade if you get through the whole thing. If you have enough work done for the first or second checkpoint, I'll just be like, hey, you know, you didn't meet criteria four at all with this. Um, I'll let you know and give you that feedback and you can correct it. Um, but as long as it meets those five criteria, Read through the documentation that I provided thoroughly. Make sure you're meeting all five criteria. Uh, and then your project's automatically approved. I don't care what you do, as long as it meets those five criteria, you're good to go. Okay, let's do it. Codings, mime types, and bytes. Let's talk about it. So, uh... The last two lectures, we were kind of, we were high level, we were front end, we were just kind of building stuff and messing around with uh, with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, especially Wednesday. Uh, we got to the point where we can write browser extensions. That's fun. I, I hope you've all been playing around with that. Uh, go write a browser extension. Take your favorite site, something you want to change about that. Write a browser extension and, you know, just go play around. Uh, I think it's really fun stuff. You've spent so long learning about programming. Here's one way that you can apply programming to your everyday life and make your life better, you know, potentially, even if by just a small amount. Um, 
So, uh, so that's exciting. Now let's kind of shift gears and go way down to the low level and talk about uh, bytes and bits. Let's do it. So you might have heard this before. You're probably quite aware of this. Is that everything in a computer, it's all just ones and zeros. There are so many layers on top of these ones and zeros that we often don't have to care about the ones and zeros. Um, but, um, but here's one case where we're going to have to be aware of it, and especially when we get to WebSockets 2, we're, we'll be at the bit level, doing bit level manipulation. So we need to be aware of ones and zeros to write these web apps and to be able to interact with the internet. So everything's binary. A copper wire can only have a high voltage or a low voltage. Your fiber can only have light and dark. You're either sending light through it or you're not. There, there's just two things that can happen. And that's the only way we can communicate information. So whenever we have something that we want to send over the internet, it's got to be bits. Ones and zeros, that's it. So how do we take ones and zeros and represent the information that we want to represent? MIME types and encodings is, of course, going to be the answer because that's what we're talking about today. So let's talk about MIME types first, and then we'll talk about encodings uh, later in lecture. So MIME types is a way for us to tell the browser from the web server perspective. It's a way for us to tell the browser what type of information we're sending in the body of an HTTP response. Uh, MIME types, this is also used in the request. So when a server, when we get to the point where browsers are starting to send information to our servers, they're also going to tell us the MIME type. So later on in the course, we'll actually be reading these and checking what the content type is that we're reading. And we do that through the content type header. We've seen one MIME type so far, text slash plain. That was a MIME type, which was us telling the browser, hey, this is plain text. Just display it as plain text to the, uh, to the user. Don't bother trying to interpret this as HTML or CSS or anything else. It's just plain text. Just throw this text up on the browser. So this content type header is going to tell the browser. That's our way of telling the browser what the type of the data is, and there's a specific format for this, a type, and then slash, and then a subtype. Uh, this does come, for what it's worth, comes from the early days of email, uh, but this has been adopted from HTTP, so that's where the acronym comes from. Uh, we just use it as the acronym now. Uh, I had to look up what the actual acronym stood for because you know it's, it's fairly irrelevant these days. Uh, but MIME type has evolved and been adapted to be used with HTTP. So a type a subtype. We have a few common types. Uh, I have a link on the uh, the reading list for this lecture that goes through every single possible MIME type. There are tons and tons of them. There are very few that we'll actually use in this course compared to how many there are, uh, how many there exist. You can look through that website that lists every single one of them uh, that's been submitted and approved. Um, but a few of the types that we'll deal with, at least text, we've seen this already with plain text, anything encoded as some textual information. This is going to include plain text like we've seen, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, really everything that we've seen for the front end so far. Uh, image, pretty self-explanatory. It's an image, raw binary information or raw bytes. Uh, I'll use those interchangeably sometimes if it's, I say, bits you know, ones and zeros, bytes, uh, eight ones and zeros. I'll use those interchangeably. Uh, depending on the context, they'll have specific meaning. Uh, but bits and bytes. Uh, videos, again, self-explanatory. Uh, the common types of, uh, of data, of information that we can send over the internet that we specify through the content type, which we use to specify the MIME type. Uh, so then we have the subtype on top of that, and we have fairly various common subtypes that we use. The text, plain we've seen. If you want HTML, again, pretty straightforward. It is this textual information, and the subtype, the information contained in this is HTML. The browser gets that and says, oh, you're sending me plain text, and it's HTML. I know what to do with that. I got it from here. I got you. Uh, CSS, JavaScript. No fancy convoluted acronyms or anything. Just if it's plain text, plain, uh, just text. If it represents HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, we got this. 
image, you're going to specify the type of image. If it's a portable network graphic, PNG. If it's a JPEG, video. I feel silly on this slide. I, there's not much for me to explain. Video, if you're sending an MP4, the MIME type is video slash MP4. If you ever are sending data uh, outside of these, you know, use those references that I linked to. Find the MIME type for the information that you're sending and send it with that MIME type. We can also specify additional information along with the MIME type in the content type header. So for example, if we want to specify the character set, if we want to send some HTML and we want to say this HTML is encoded using UTF-8, we separate the MIME type and any extra parameters, any extra options with by semicolons, and then the format is name equals value. So my content type header contains the value text slash HTML semicolon char set equals UTF-8. And the browser is going to parse this. It's going to look for the semicolon. It's going to grab the MIME type. That's always going to be first. And then it's going to read this and say, oh, this is encoded with UTF-8. Let me make sure that I'm using UTF-8 to decode this. These days, you can get away without having the char type often. Uh, because they'll default, the browser will default to UTF-8 because that's a, a growing standard. It's really standard these days. To be backward compatible with older browsers or somebody hasn't updated their browser in a long time, you can make sure you specify the char type to UTF-8. Modern browsers, everybody's up to date. Uh, you'll get away without it, but you really should have the char type to specify, hey, this is UTF-8. Make sure you know, um, make sure you know how to decode that. Text JavaScript, what I find is application JavaScript, if I remember correctly. So text JavaScript is the correct way to do it. Application JavaScript is also accepted by uh, you pretty universally by almost every browser. Um, but the, the documentation says it should be text JavaScript because it is textual information. It's not uh, not application information. Um, but the, that kind of grew, that kind of spread that, uh, that people use application JavaScript. Uh, I've used it before too, not knowing. Um, I checked uh, cc312.com and my Nginx server is actually sending application JavaScript. So even Nginx is, is on that application JavaScript. So it is what it is, but the official documentation said, uh, says text JavaScript. If you do application JavaScript, I'm not going to get mad at you in this class. Um, but to be universally applied to even older browsers, Text JavaScript is guaranteed to work. Uh, and I think that's all I have to say about oh right uh, I think that's all I have to say about MIME types themselves until we uh, we talk about security related to MIME types. So any questions about MIME types? I feel like this is pretty straightforward. But if anybody has uh, still questions about how to set a header, uh, for example, the header format, uh, any MIME type questions. And yeah, I, like I said, I don't have much else to say about that. It, it's You set the MIME type. You find the MIME type for the data you want to send. Um, so if there are questions, please let me know. But I, I don't know what else to say about that. You, you set the right MIME type. Browsers will sn what we call sniff out MIME types. Is this all defined in the R HTTP RFC doc? Uh, HTTP defines how to set the headers. Uh, and then it defers to MIME type documentation and says, you can set the MIME type, uh, just uh, go go read this other documentation, and then that'll specify what MIME types are valid uh, and which are not. Um, so the, the format of the header, the fact that you can set a content type, HTTP is like, you got to have a content type, tell me what your content type is, uh, specify the MIME type, but for a specific list of MIME types, go elsewhere. And I link to that documentation uh, from the course website for the uh, MIME type documentation. So the browser will sniff out the proper MIME type. So if you have the wrong MIME type or no MIME type, modern browsers are going to work with you and try to figure out what the MIME type is. So if you have, if, if uh, for example, you don't know, 
you want to send text JavaScript or application JavaScript, or maybe you just do JavaScript slash this is my code, it's really awesome as your MIME type, the browser is going to look at the file that you're sending, uh, the information that you're sending, and realize that it's not file. You're not sending a file. I misspoke there. Uh, but the data that you're sending and kind of figure out what it is. It's going to start looking at it and say, you know what? This looks like JavaScript. I'm going to render this as JavaScript because it looks like JavaScript to me, even though you had a broken MIME type. Your MIME type doesn't match anything. This can be bad sometimes if it sniffs out the wrong MIME type. And if you're certain about your MIME types, which you should be and you have to be for the homework, you can set a specific header, specific HTTP header, this X content type options, no sniff. This tells the browser not to do MIME type sniffing. It says, you know what? My MIME type is right. I don't care what you say. My MIME type is right. Do not sniff out a different MIME type. Whatever my MIME type is, stick with that. And then if there's an error, if you do have the wrong MIME type, the browser is not going to attempt to render that as something else. So if you have uh, text JavaScript as your MIME type on the response to your CS CSS file, the browser is not going to say, hey, this looks like CSS. I'm just going to sniff it out as CSS and render it as CSS and render this as a style sheet. The browser won't do that if you have this header set. For homework two, you have to set this header. So I want to make sure you have the right MIME type so that you understand how to set the content type. Get the right MIME type for the information that you're sending uh, and set this no sniff. So if you don't have the right MIME type, the browser is going to let you know, like, hey, set your right MIME type um, because we're not going to be sloppy and just rely on modern browsers to fix our mistakes in this class. That's not, not the point of what we're doing here. So we're going to set the no sniff. And it's standard practice to set this on everything. Uh, a lot of sites, if you just, uh, and by the way, it's a quick side note here. One of the fun things about this class, even teaching it, I, I do this a lot, is when you're when you're learning something new, you have seemingly infinite examples out there. Just go to any website, open up the browser console, and see how they do it. Uh, a lot of sites will set this no sniff on every response. Uh, some don't, some do, uh, but a lot of them do. There's a good reason to set this. Uh, the one I pitched already is you should be you should have the correct MIME type, so don't rely on the browser. Uh, but out there in industry, you know, that's not a compelling argument. Uh, but what is, actually it is a compelling argument, because if somebody's browser doesn't sniff out the right type and you're relying on that sniffing, then your site's going to be broken in that browser, But and you'll be like, well, it works in my modern up-to-date Chrome, and somebody's using an outdated version of Internet Explorer. Uh, or even an outdated version of Edge, and it doesn't sniff out the right MIME type, well, you, the developer, is to blame there because you don't have the right MIME type set and you're relying on a modern browser for your testing. You probably have the most up-to-date browser if you're a developer, but if you're you know, an average user, might not have updated their browser uh, in you know sometimes years. So uh, relying on that's just bad practice, first of all. But there is a security reason here. This is our first big security concern in this class. So if you are relying on MIME type sniffing from the browser and you're serving user submitted content, say you have an image upload site like you will for your project, you'll have some multimedia content that users are submitting and sharing with other users. So say you have the ability to on your site, on your app, for users to <laughs> set Internet Explorer, to upload images and those images will be displayed to all users. Well, now a clever user says, I know you asked for an image, but I'm not going to upload an image. I'm going to upload this JavaScript code that I wrote that you know destroys things and steals personal information and just uh, attempts to steal your cookies on other sites and just generally wrecks things. Uh, so some attack JavaScript code that they wrote, and they're going to upload that instead of an image. So now you serve that content to all of your users. You're not setting your no sniff. And the browser says, yo, this isn't a, I know you said this was image slash, slash PNG, uh, but this looks like JavaScript. I'm going to run this as JavaScript because I sniffed out the MIME type and I looked, I saw you had the wrong MIME type. I'm going to treat this as the JavaScript that it is and run it. 
Now you have an attack script running on all of your users' machines, uh, which I hopefully don't have to explain that that's a bad thing. Very bad thing. But if you set the content type options no sniff, you say, hey, browser, I have the right content type. If the content type does not match the content, don't sniff out the content and run it. So now you set it to image PNG. You have no sniff. That JavaScript code, the browser is going to look at it and say, this is not an image, but you told me you were confident in your MIME type. So I am not going to run this attack script. Uh, and bam, we're protected against one attack that users can, um, can attempt. They're not sending, they can send their JavaScript. We can save that JavaScript in our, or in our database, serve it to our users, send them the attack script, but their browser is going to say, hey, not an image. I'm not falling for that. Big security, uh, big security vulnerability that we can enable if we don't have this no sniff. So, in just a little foreshadow here, we're going to set the content type now. But once we start receiving information, I already foreshadowed this. But um, once we start receiving information, we're going to have the content type being sent to us so we know how to parse the requests. Right now we're just sending setting the content type of our responses, but that will get flipped on us and we'll be reading content type and content length also. Content length is going to be a very important header to read once the client starts sending us, our servers, information. Uh, so these will get flipped around. The format for HTTP requests and responses is almost identical except for that first line. Uh, so all this stuff is going to get flipped on us and being parsed by our servers as well. Images. Oh, yeah, that should be image. Did I mess up that, that documentation? That should be image because images is part of objective four. Images is inject objective four. Image is objective three. That, there is a big distinction. I have to correct that in the documentation. All right, any questions about MIME types, MIME type sniffing, setting your MIME types, content type? While I'm waiting for questions, I, I want to check that. Did I really mess that up? Oh, in my, in my example code, I messed it up. I, I see what you're saying. mess up cat and kitten this should be images this should have an s for objective four so i have the bold s to make sure that's clear maybe i should have just gave them really different path names uh this should be image singular but did i mess that up on flamingo is the question oh and i messed up cat and kitten that one yeah, that one I'm, I'm more okay with. <laughs> but yeah, that image is kitten.jpg. Uh, you know what? I'm kind of losing losing where I'm clicking. I'll do that after, after lecture. I don't have to do this right now. I was more curious, and there's enough time to ask questions. Actually, oh, my... my, my. That's a, that's a good question, Mim. Will it change the content type? Uh, it, I think that'll depend on the browser. That would be interesting to test. The browser might change the MIME type before it's sent as well. It might sniff it out as it's sending. I would imagine it would, actually. Depending on the JavaScript that we have that's processing that and sending it and creating the, the request, the browser might change it before sending it um, but the browser will also sniff it out when we respond if we're setting our content type to png uh, it'll say i'm going to ignore your content type and change it to javascript was more the context that i was worried about but it might also send it so we might be able to tell in our server once we get the information hey the content type is javascript i was asking for an image 
I'm not processing this. Uh, and even if it doesn't, you can do a little bit of your own content type sniffing. Uh, you could check, make sure this is a valid PNG, open it with some library, make sure it opens and, and renders. You get RGB values, valid values and everything before saving it in your database too. There are uh, other things we can do. Uh, but for this context, when you're sending it, set the right content type and uh, disable sniffing. It says images, but it works for you. I wonder, I'll have to double check that and see what I messed up. You know what? I, I know why, because the, I, I will have to fix that. But it says images because my directory name is images and it's just opening the file directly without going through your server. But once it goes through your server, uh, I'll have to fix that. So it'll work until you actually write your server. Then it's not going to work when you code objective three. I'll just rename the directory to image. Right. Does that make sense? I don't know. All right, let's talk about encoding text. Uh, this is going to get a bit more technical than the MIME types. This is more juicy content, in my opinion. So we only got ones and zeros. We haven't really talked about the ones and zeros. We haven't gotten to the byte level yet. So let's, exactly, let's do exactly that. So when it's just ones and zeros, just binary data, how do we send text? How do we send the, the letter T, for example, over the internet? when all we can send is binary information, binary just bits. Uh, you probably heard of this before, ASCII. This is how we're gonna, going to uh, send text, is encode our text into bytes and then send those bytes over the internet. One encoding to do that is ASCII, A-S-C-I-I. -I. I, to be honest, I don't even remember what that stands for. Uh, pronounced ASCII. And this is a, an encoding that takes seven bits and maps every character to a seven bit value. So now we can send those seven bits over the internet, usually represented using one byte, send that over the internet. And then the receiving end, they'll read that, they'll understand, hey, this is ASCII text and then decode that back to the characters that they represent, and then they can, it can display that information to the user. American Standard Code for Information inter Interchange? Why, well, you know, I might not have ever heard that because I'd remember that sounding so ridiculous. American Standard Code for Information in Interchange. But why? <laughs> you could They could have chosen any acronym, but that's what they went for. At least it's pronounced, you know, ASCII, you know, maybe that's what they went for. They just wanted to call it ASCII and they had to come up with something for the acronym to, to stand for. Yeah, I'd rather have done ASCII. Yo. So this is ASCII. This is ASCII in its entirety. We have numbers that map to characters and we can represent those as hex values. So like the hex value 75, which would be zero one 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 oh man I, I put myself in a hole here zero one zero one uh in binary that would be sent over the internet and then the receiver knows that that's a lowercase u likewise if you want a uh you know an uppercase l that's the decimal number 76 the hex value for c and you know send that over the internet uh, and we have special characters as well. Space characters is this uh, hex 20. If you ever seen percent 20 in a uh, in a URL, that's the ASCII encoded uh, the ASCII encoded space. So that means a space character. If you do a Google search with spaces in it, look at the URL and you'll see some percent 20s in there. Uh, that's the um, you can't have a space in a URL, so they encode that in its ASCII bytes and then send that as part of the URL. So it's a, a, a an escaped character and just says the bytes of the URL encoding to get us what we want. Uh, there is, where am I looking? Wow, 
I, I can't even find what I'm looking for. Oh, here it is. Like carriage return and line feed. So these are also ASCII characters. If you see a an A, a, uh, an A and a D, um, C, R, L, F. So if you see D, A, that's going to be your carriage return line feed. Those are ASCII characters. They're, they're special ASCII characters, not the, the, you know, the symbols that we're used to. But it's uh, uh, all this is encoded in ASCII. So this is ASCII. We have 0 through 127, 7 bits of information. So we have 2 to the 7 values that we can have, 127 different characters that we can encode in ASCII. And every single value is used for something. Yeah, you can replace letters with their hex equivalent as well in a URL. Uh, in most cases, like if you do that for your server that you're writing, you don't have anything on your server that's decoding those. So, uh, so of course that's going to break in your, your server, but, uh, but most servers, commercial servers are going to decode those and then process them normally. Uh, so you could completely hex and code a Google search in a URL and then send that and Google will be like, yeah, I know what you mean. So if we want to represent the string hello, we want to send this over the internet. This is a language-specific representation. Every language has their own implementation of a string. A string is not a universal thing. Those are language-specific. So if you have a string in your code, in your Python program, in your JavaScript program, uh, Node with JavaScript is a little bit of a bad example because their TCP code auto-converts strings to bytes. Um, so we'll talk about that when we do examples on Monday. Uh, so you have this language specific string and you want to send this over the internet. We got to get this into bits. So first we encode this string using our encoding, in this case ASCII, and convert that to its bytes. So we want a byte array that's going to have these values, 6, 8, 6, 5, 6, C, 6, C, 6, F. And those are going to be the bytes that represent this string. Now bytes, every language, every computer on the planet is going to be able to speak bytes. Every every computer, every machine understands what bytes are um, because they, well, actually, uh, every computer is going to understand what bits are. I'll, I'll go that far at least. Uh, so these bytes are a series of ones and zeros. Convert those into their binary equivalent. And then this gets sent over the internet. These ones and zeros in this sequence, this zero is going to be sent, the one's going to be sent, etc. That gets fired across the internet. The receiver gets these ones and zeros, decides that this is ASCII text encoded with ASCII, decodes this. It will usually think about it in bytes. We won't usually get down to the binary level. Uh, receive these bytes and decode them applying ASCII, decode them into their language-specific string, and then start working with the string. So this is where if you're using Python, you have that encode and decode. You're, this is exactly what you're doing, taking a Python string, encoding it into a byte array, sending the bytes over the internet, and then when you receive something on, over your TCP connection, you're receiving bytes, and you're decoding that into a Python string so you can work with it. It's specifically because of the encodings. This uh, this is the only, uh, I don't know why I'm tripping over the sense. This is the only encoding that you can assume the headers and request status line are encoded in, in an HTTP request or response. But you can assume that they are encoded with ASCII, which is a very powerful and, and useful assumption. So when you get an HTTP re uh, request in your server, you can parse the headers using ASCII. You can decode them as ASCII text and read what all the headers say. Then the headers might tell you to use a different encoding for the body of the request. But the header can always, you can always assume it's ASCII and you can't assume that it's anything else. You assume it's ASCII, HTTP headers, ASCII characters only. So when you're sending or receiving headers, ASCII characters only. Uh, that's the only thing you can guarantee is going to work in every browser. So that's what we're going to work with. 
ASCII for headers. The body could be something completely different. You have to parse the headers to figure out if there's a different encoding for the body. So there's a big problem with this. ASCII can only represent these you know, 0 through 127 characters. So this is great for English because we have the English alphabet. We have uppercase and lowercase um, English letters, or 26 letters. But if you want to use any language that doesn't use the English alphabet, uh, you're pretty screwed. You can't represent very much with this, uh, especially now that the whole world is connected. We can't just have a, an English-only encoding and say we're done with that. Uh, so we need more. We need more than seven bits. We need to expand this a bit. And this is where UTF-8 comes to the rescue. This is pretty much the standard for text encoding these days uh, is UTF-8. It has enough bits to represent just about everything you know everything we need there's tons of unused um, encodings with utf-8 uh, we can encode a lot more characters so if a new language comes along uh, and needs their entire language added to utf-8 no big deal there's room for that uh, there's plenty of room in utf-8 for everybody so this standard came along and and uh, really took over there are others there's utf uh, UTF-16 and other ones, but UTF-8 is the one that really stuck. That's the one that is usually the default. When, you, when you're when you in your Python program and you say dot .encode, dot .decode, those methods actually take an encoding as an argu as a parameter, but, uh, but the default is UTF-8. So if you just say encode, decode, Python's like, you mean UTF-8, don't you? I got gotcha. you. I know what you're talking about. The encoding that we use these days. Especially since the internet's become popular, we had this need, UTF-8, that's the answer. That's the solution. So with UTF-8, one of the, the really nice things, the, a really beautiful feature about UTF-8, something I wish more you know developers out there would, would be conscious of these kinds of issues, this backward compatibility, is that UTF-8 is a superset of ASCII. If you get in UTF-8 encoded information, you get a byte of information and it starts with a zero. That byte encodes a U, U, an ASCII character. The remaining seven bits are an ASCII character. It's exactly ASCII. In ASCII, it only uses seven bits. So if you're sending a byte of ASCII, it's going to have a leading zero. And UTF-8 says, well, if there's a leading zero, it's ASCII. Just treat it as ASCII. Done. If the first bit is a 1, then that means we have a multi-byte character. So every ASCII character is a single byte. If we have a leading 1, we know we have multiple bytes to represent that character. So if, the, if we receive a byte of information, we're decoding UTF-8, which you won't have to get into this level of detail, but I want to show why UTF-8 sometimes has multiple bytes. Uh, if you're decoding UTF-8 and you see a 1 as the first, as the most significant bit in a byte, you know that you have a multi-byte character. You know you have a non-ASCII UTF-8 character. So if the leading byte, the first byte you read starts with two 1s and then a 0, you have a 2-byte character. If it's three 1s and a 0, you have a 3-byte character. And if it's four 1s and a 0, you have a 4-byte character. And each continuation byte is going to start with one zero. So as long as you're reading a one, you know you're in the process of decoding a multi-byte character. So anything outside of ASCII is going to take more than one byte to encode. I'll say that a whole bunch more times, even on Monday especially, uh, because it's very important. Very important. This is something that we do have to be aware of. There are some characters that have multi-byte encodings in UTF-8. Uh, I got ahead of my slides a little bit there. Uh, one nice thing, again, something we won't have to, to worry about, but a nice feature about UTF-8 is that no character, no character's encoding is a subsequence of another character. So every with these leading bits, we can guarantee that it, no two byte character is going to be part of a three byte a four byte or a three byte character because none of these start with one one zero 
Uh, it, you just can't fit any two byte character inside one of these three or four byte characters. And same with the one byte. None of these bytes start with zero. So a byte starting with zero is not going to appear anywhere in a UTF-8 encoded string unless it's an ASCII character. If a byte starts with one zero, then it must be a continuation byte that was preceded either by two ones, three ones, or four ones. Uh, so very nice feature of UTF-8. It really reduces, significantly reduces decoding errors uh, because if, if there is actually a bit that's flipped, uh, especially if it's in one of these leading bits, you don't just get a complete mess of decoding. You usually get a decoding error. Hey, this isn't valid UTF-8. Uh, double check what happened and, uh, and fix that before getting back to me. Yeah, we just need char set UTF-8 and then the browser and your language of choice take it over from there. Uh, that is a, a library we can use. I only have two slides on the specific details of UTF-8. That's it. But the important takeaway for us is that some characters have multi-byte encodings. Uh, so, uh, which we, which I will mention, like I said, a, bunch, a lot more times. So, when we're sending strings over the internet, the internet doesn't know about our language-specific strings. Convert to bytes, so we encode a string using UTF-8, and then send it over the internet. We can't send strings over the internet. It can't be done. We can send encoded, we can take those strings, encode them using UTF-8, and then send those bytes over the internet. TCP sockets, TCP connections, they can only transmit bytes because that's all the underlying copper and fiber can transmit is bytes. You can't tell a fiber optic cable to send your string over the internet. It's not going to happen no matter how hard you try. But you can convert your string to bytes and send those bytes one bit at a time over that cable. That's going to work fine for you. So we have to encode the string in using UTF-8, send it over the internet. Likewise, when we receive information, it's always, always, always bytes that we're getting. We get bytes over that TCP connection, and then we have to decode those bytes using UTF-8 and decode them into our language-specific strings. And then we can start working with those strings. So if you're wondering, why do I have to call encode and decode in my code? Um, this is exactly why. If you are using Node with JavaScript, I'll remind you again, and again, we'll see this on Monday, I'll give examples. Uh, Node, Node's net package will do a lot of this behind the scenes. Uh, so you have to be aware of that because we will get to the point where you have to work with the bytes. And if Java, uh, J JavaScript and Node are auto-converting, sometimes you don't want that to happen because you have to look at the bytes later in the semester when we have non-text information, uh, you have to look at the bytes that we're receiving. You have to look at the bytes. Actually, we're in for homework, uh, I take that back, for homework two, you have to send images. You have to send non-text information. So you have to peel back that layer and manually send the bytes. So why is it so important that some characters have multi-byte encodings? Well, it's when you're calculating the content length. So if you're taking content length as the length of a string, so content length is always the number of the, uh, the content length is always the number of bytes that you're sending in the body of that response. It's always the number of bytes. So if you're computing content length using the length of your string, you're wrong. Unless that string is all ASCII characters, which for homework one, uh, it was all ASCII characters on purpose. So you could just use the length of the string because we didn't talk about encodings yet. For homework two, if you're taking the length of the string and then sending that as the content length, sending that as the content length header, it's not going to work the way you want it to. Things are going to break. Because once you have non-ASCII characters in there, if you're sending a, a site with a lot of Chinese, a lot of Mandarin text, and you're saying the length of the string, that's my content length, well, guess what? That is not even close to your content length because the content length is the number of bytes and you have a lot of multi-byte characters in your content. So the content length is not going to match the actual length of the content in bytes that you're sending if you're taking the length of the string. Uh, this is in homework two. It's uh, objective two is to send that UTF-8 file with, uh, with UTF-8 characters. 
If you don't have the right content length, the browser is not going to display all of your content. If you have the content length as the length of your string, it's going to truncate that. It's going to cut off some of your content because it's only reading the content length number of bytes. And it's going to cut off some of uh, the end of your response. So make sure you're taking the length, the number of bytes, that's your content length, not the length of your string. And that's the big takeaway. That's the one you really have to be aware of when you're writing your server. So convert to bytes in Python. It's that um, that encode, encode into UTF-8. Get that byte array that you're going to send. That length or length of that, that's your content length, and then send the bytes. Like the file dot encode, uh, kind of. It depends what file is is representing. You got to open the file, but yeah, that that's the idea. Uh, length of string dot encode, and then send the encoding. But make sure you encode first before checking the length. So what about non-text data? So that was all text. We had to talk pretty. Uh, pretty far at length about textual data. What about non-text? For objective three, you're sending images. So to send an image, read the file and send it. The content length is the size of the file. And the content type is image slash whatever image type it is. JPG for the, the homework. And that's it. So the, an image is already encoded in bytes. We don't have to worry about encoding. There is an encoding with image, images, JPEG, PNG. These are encodings. But we're not messing with those encodings. We're not doing image processing here. We can read the file as bytes and then send those bytes, set that those bytes as the body of our response, set the content type, set the content length, and send that response on its way. Do not overthink this. I think I... Do not overthink this. Yeah, there it is. Don't overthink sending images. You're, you're just reading the bytes and sending those bytes. So it's important to never try to use your string methods on these bytes. These bytes are not encoded using UTF-8. They're encoded using PNG. They're encoded using JPEG. Your videos are encoded using MP4. You know, whatever your types are, whatever your file types are, they have their own encodings and their own protocols that we're not going to dive into uh, that we and that we don't have to worry about. We're just going to take this file that has its encoding, read the bytes, never treat it as a string. So when you've opened files in, in the past, you've probably almost always at least, read them as strings and decoded them using UTF-8 as you read them. Uh, just the, if you do like read all lines or something like that, or iterate over the lines of a file, you're iterating over them as those files as strings. So there was something extra we had to do when reading text files or CSVs or the like, or JSON files. When we're reading image files, you just want to read the file as bytes. So whatever language you're using, make sure you read the file uh, file reading library, read your documentation, and make sure you're reading that in byte mode. Read the bytes, get the entire file in a byte array, get the length of that array, that's your content length, and ship that entire byte array over your TCP socket. But your TCP socket is expecting a byte array, with strings, there's some extra work to do. You have to encode your string into a byte array and then ship it. With an image, read it as a read the file as a byte array and ship it. Done. Don't overthink this one. Don't overthink sending images. Um, you already have it in bytes. It's already in bytes. That's how you're reading the file. Read it in bytes. Ship it. That's it. Uh, the only even little bit of a trick here is you have your response. Uh, your status line and your headers, that's textual information. You have your uh, your blank line, your slash r slash n at the end of your headers. And then you need this image appended to the end of that. So you want to convert your string, all your headers, convert that to a byte array, and then append the file to the end of that. So you have one large byte array, and then send that on its way. So you have to, you have an image, 
and a string that you're concatenating together. So you want to make sure both of those are encoded as byte arrays, combine the two arrays, and then send it over the TCP socket.